Thank you, young ladies, for a pretty song. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We still have snow on the ground, but rain is coming. <laughs> and it's going to get cold again, so keep your winter coats handy and your summer coats, rain coats handy. Good to see each and every one here this morning. May the Lord bless you as you hear his word. May we pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come into thy house to hear thy word. And we pray, O Lord, that thy spirit may guide us. We pray that thou will give us attentive ears, that we may hear thy word through thy servant John. We ask, O Lord, that thou will be with those who have other problems. We ask that you will be with them and let your presence be known. We ask that you will be with our nation. We see a nation going downhill, trying to put you out of everything that we have. We ask, O oh Lord, that there will be, be a revival in our nations and in other nations, that people will come to know and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for your son who died for our sins. And we ask, O oh Lord, that thou will guide us now through the remainder of this service, that when we leave here, that we may continue to serve you throughout your land. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Please stand and sing our hymn of praise number 14, Praise the Lord the Almighty. Please stand. neighbor by passing the peace of Christ.
Did they make it there through that weather? Welcome indeed to worship at First Baptist. Good to be together in God's house. The men who are here from the breakfast need water with all that country ham. Uh, salty, it sure was good. It was a very salty breakfast. But it was good and we appreciate all those that helped make it possible. We have a good many announcements in our bulletin and some not in the bulletin. Next Sunday is Super Bowl. We spell it with, we spell it S-O-U-P-E-R here at First Baptist. We ask, we have a tradition of asking you to bring a can of soup for our Super Bowl and a dollar for the community center. And uh, Sunday evening, if you're interested, some of us will be going to Calvary Baptist Church Lexington to help out in their uh, Super Bowl party there. And uh, Hopefully they'll have the footballs inflated uh, for the Super Bowl. <laughs> Bridal shower this afternoon at 2 o'clock for our church secretary. February the 5th, the four Bs will be having lunch at Maddie's on Main, right here in Winchester. And dessert at Tasty Time at the Kroger Plaza. Bring shampoo or vegetable soup for the community center. Sign up sheet out here on the bulletin board. February the 15th is Sock Sunday at First Baptist Church. There's been a new emergency shelter open in our town, Beacon of Hope, and uh, they need socks for some of the residents there. So bring socks. There's a place to put them. A tote bag here in the foyer will be uh, for your donations. Where will it be, Francis? Out here, okay, all right. And of course, the rehearsals are going on for the Easter cantata, 7.15 to 7.45 every Wednesday night. Are there other announcements? If not, let's sing a great old hymn, number 524. We're marching to Zion, let me, let me stand as we sing.
Jim Davis, would you lead us in our offertory prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful we can come to your house this morning to worship you, to study your word. We pray, Father, we will grow in faith each day so that we may serve you better. For the only way to serve you fully is to love you fully, Father, and be totally obedient to thy will. We thank you for all your many blessings, and we pray that you will now take these offerings to the furtherment of thy kingdom's work. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our community of faith at First Baptist has been touched by crisis and tragedy and illness in recent days. At Clark Regional Hospital, Robert Abner remains in intensive care, struggling with pneumonia, and that takes a good bit of family out of our church this morning. Pray for David and Kathy and, and uh, Ruby and Robert. Ann Cooper uh, has been in the hospital in the latter part of the week. She has gone home today. Uh, keep her in your prayers. Joyce Roark uh, this morning um, during Sunday school was en route to Central Baptist Hospital with, they think, uh, gallbladder problems. Don't know any more yet about that. Um, had a tragedy in Powell County over the weekend. Tyler Brewer was killed in an automobile accident on Friday night or Saturday morning. And uh, he's uh, had just become a Marine. Um, he was in our church in his first cousin's wedding. Christian Brewer, who married Jacqueline Nally here. Time gets away from me. Be a year in July. Has been, yes, year and a half. And um, he was killed in an automobile accident Please keep that family in your prayers. Kyle Batons was also in an automobile accident yesterday morning on his way to work at Toyota. Um, he uh, broke his femur um, in the upper leg and it was a very serious break and went through the skin in a great deal of pain and they've had to put a steel rod in there and reconstruct his femur. He's at UK Hospital. Are there others? On our prayer list, you'll notice uh, a long, long list. Help us keep that up uh, to date, please. Um, we continue to remember Shelly Spiegel as she nurses her sister along who was in an automobile uh, life-threatening accident a couple of weeks ago. Our Scripture for today comes from the 11th chapter of Hebrews, uh, often called by scholars the roll call of the faithful. The first 16 verses. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence or conviction of things unseen. For by it the men of old received divine approval by faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen is, was made out of things that are unseen. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, 
through which he received approval as righteous, God bearing witness by accepting his gifts. He died, but through his faith, he's still speaking. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was attested as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, took heed and constructed an ark and the saving of his for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was to go. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles in the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. May God bless the reading of his word as we pray. Our Father, as we gather this morning, our thoughts and prayers go out to these families who are hurting, hurting from having lost a loved one, hurting because a loved one's life is threatened. We lift them up before you. We pray that your abiding presence will be with them. We pray your guidance of the doctors and nurses and medical team that your healing powers can be at work through them. We pray divine comfort for this family in Powell County who's lost a son. We know that you are the God of comfort and consolation, and most of all, the God of life eternal. We gather in the name of Jesus Christ to lift up that gospel truth again in worship, we pray for those who are traveling today, many of whom are part of this fellowship. We pray for the world in which we live. We are reminded even in scripture that we are called to go ye therefore to all nations. In doing so, may we be willing to begin where we are, realizing there are people in this community that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord, people whom we've not yet met. May we be reminded that you call us to embrace them, strangers, to share with them the love of Christ, the forgiveness of sin that we have experienced, and the humble walk with Christ, opportunity that we are given. Now speak through your written word 
from Hebrews today we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Consider today the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. My grandfather said that when an optimist and a pessimist sit down for dinner, the pessimist will say, is there any milk in that yonder pitcher, while the, pessim while the optimist will say, please pass the cream. 
But in a deeper sense, there is a great deal of difference in the outlook of the optimist and the pessimist, and it is a life-changing difference. Some years ago, Martha Pumphrey taught a study course, Attitude is my paintbrush. And that has partly to do with outlook, optimism, or pessimism. The pessimist believes generally that, that the future is foreboding and that you need to live defensively because something bad is going to happen and you need to be prepared for it. You need to avoid all risk. Don't stick your neck out. You need to conserve what you have. You need to build some sort of a defensive edifice around your life and live extremely carefully. And of course, as with all extremes, there's some truth in those words. Something bad can happen, and it helps to be prepared. But when it's a complete consuming outlook, then life becomes a series of, see if I can make it through this minefield. And that's not very much fun. The optimist, on the other hand, believes something good is going to happen out there. The future has promise. William Faulkner, the great Mississippi Southern writer, whose papers were at the university where I was pastor, town where I was pastor 20 years, and I became a bit familiar with William Faulkner. His papers are at Southeast Missouri State University, and the procurator of those papers was Dr. Robert Hamblin, a deacon in our church there and a professor of literature at that university. One of the things I learned about Faulkner was his quote that mankind will not only survive, he will prevail. You ever heard that quote? The, the pessimist goes through life seeking to survive. The optimist hopes to triumph and prevail over whatever circumstances or challenges lie ahead. The best is yet to come. Destiny holds goodness. A lot of prophets of doom always have been. The best is behind us. I like the prophet of hope the old Oklahoma boy, Will Rogers, who said things ain't like they used to be and probably never was. The good old days that we talk about, how did we like them? No electricity, no plumbing. Any of you remember those days? <laughs> no cell phones. We probably could do without them. But. So the optimist lives a life of faith. That God is not dead, something good lies ahead no matter how bad the present may be. And Abraham is our example, Exhibit A today, of that kind of life as we look down the road to a new year, getting ready in a few days to pass out of that threshold month of January and encounter the year for real when we remember to write on our checks 2015 and realize how old we are, and so on, and begin to encounter the new year. Abraham went out, and the Bible says he went out, went forward and toward the promised land, not knowing where he was to go. Now, does that sound very smart? To take off with your whole family, and you don't know where you're going. That sounds a little bit irresponsible, doesn't it? But that's kind of one of the crazy characteristics of faith. Faith is not always reasonable. Faith doesn't always seem wise. Faith takes some risks. I remember in the 80s, there was a great emphasis on long-range planning, establish where you want to go, and write a five-year long-range plan. Well, in the 90s and since, those plans are mostly on the shelf because things changed so much by the time those five years got there that the plans were irrelevant. There is a real sense in which we ought to try to know where we're going, but there's also the truth that none of us really know, do we? We don't know what 2015 will bring. But let's go anyway, what do you say? I mean, what are our choices really? What drove Abraham to be able to do that? To follow God's call, he didn't know where he was going, but he, know, he knew who had called him. And the only thing that the author of Hebrews can come up with as the answer to that, the force that drove Abraham, and he uses the word pistuo, 
23 times in these verses, in this chapter, and it's the word for faith. By faith, Abraham took off not knowing where he was to go. Faith in God, faith in the future, faith in himself, faith in other people, a sometimes lacking commodity in our world today, as the prognosticators seem to want to convince us that we're going on a downhill spiral. To completely believe that is to give up on God. Think about it. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out, and he didn't know where he was going, but he knew who called him. Jim Davis is a former military man, and I'm reminded of that now and then. And he uses military analogies. Jim, if the commander says forward march, what do you do? Do you say where? Where are we going? You just go, don't you? You just march because the commander said march. And sometimes you're not even supposed to know because it's top secret. Well, maybe God has some secrets as well. He did for Abraham. Abraham left the familiar, the comfortable, family, pulled up stakes because that's what pioneers do. Pioneers are optimistic. They, they're willing to go where they have not been. They're willing to pull up from what seems secure. They're willing to believe that maybe there's something even better out there that I'll miss and that we will miss if we don't go forward together. You see this principle at work, this principle of faith, this principle of moving forward, this principle of being willing to take risk in so many realms of life, this notion of engaging the future rather than seeking simply to survive. Investors tell us if you want to if you want to grow your worth, you've got to be willing to take some what? Cause some risk. If you're satisfied with where you are, okay. Don't take any risk. But if you want to grow something, invest. You've got to take, yes, you can lose. But you know what the old saying is, coach, no pain, no gain. You've got to be willing to launch out, to go somewhere where one hasn't been. We know the parable of the talents, don't we? The master of the house left his servants talents. Those were units of money, and they did various things with them. What did one of them do? He buried it in the ground. When the master came back, he said, here, here it is. Well, it had lost because of inflation, hadn't it? And so he took it away from him. He said, you, you haven't done anything with it, so I'm going to give it to somebody else. On another occasion, Jesus would teach that if you're faithful in a little, maybe you'll have much. If you prove yourself, it's true in the physical realm. If we're tired and, and sore and, and don't have much energy, sometimes it's because we've been exercising, but more often than that, it's because we what? We haven't been. And so our bodies have gotten used to the rest. The body that is at rest tends to Stay at rest. And the quickest cure that the doctor and the therapist will tell us about our muscles that have grown tired, you need to use them more. Don't overdo it. Start gradually, but get out and walk or exercise that muscle. Push it beyond where it wants to go. And then it will grow stronger. Pioneer, you see. Growth. It's true in the mental as well. The mind that doesn't think many thoughts, probably develops a bit of atrophy, just like the muscle that doesn't do much. I remember my father would shave with that electric razor, and in front of the mirror, he'd have poems scotch taped up. That's before the age of posted notes. With poems, and while he'd shave, he'd memorize a poem. He spent his last months at Rosemary Brooks' place in a one-room apartment with a little bathroom. And on that bathroom went a mirror still in his 90s. There were taped new poems that he was enjoying memorizing. He didn't want his brain to, to grow old. Of course, time works against us, 
in that respect. There's no avoidance of that. But if we get atrophied and think less thoughts, it, we get old quicker. We need the stimulation mentally, just like our muscles, new thoughts. Through Isaiah, God said to God's people, come let us reason together. My thoughts are not your thoughts. You need to think my thoughts after me, and they will be new thoughts that you haven't thought before. And they sought to cling to the old notions, the old prejudices, the old paths. I've told you about my grandfather in southeast Missouri in the early days of the automobile, early 1900s, before the roads were paved or even graveled a lot of them, and there were deep ruts in the roads. And now and then he said, you come across a sign. I never saw it, but he usually told the truth. Choose your ruts wisely. You will be with them, in them a long time. That is so true about life, so relevant to the coming of the new year, to get out of the old ruts, to choose them wisely. Paul wrote, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Jesus came along saying, I came to bring new wine. Now, Baptists have a hard time maybe appreciating that passage. I came to bring new wine, and it won't fit in the old skins. If you put new wine in the old skins, what happens? It bursts the skins. Or maybe you're a seamstress. You can't sew new cloth on an old cloth. Because when it gets washed in strength and shrinks, it will tear. Newness. Anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Maybe the thoughts I've been thinking need some updating. Be not conformed to this world, Paul wrote to the Romans, chapter 12, I believe. Be not conformed to this world and its way of thinking, but be transformed by the renewal of your what? Your minds. Renewal of your minds. In spite of the plethora of television stations available floating around in the air today, my favorite television station is still KET. <laughs> yeah, it's free too, but uh, because I learn. I mean, nothing still more exciting than learning something that you don't know. The renewal of our minds is true mentally. It's true spiritually as well. It's true spiritually, in a sense. Not all that God has to say and reveal, I haven't, I haven't heard it all yet. And it cannot all be contained in this creed or that creed or sp four spiritual laws or some papal encyclical or the Baptist faith and message or anybody else's attempt to sum it all up and stuff it in a jar and put the lid on it. God spiritually is the God of newness as well. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the riches that God has prepared for us. And surely those are spiritual riches that we can yet discover. We don't have it all down yet. Last Sunday we emphasized that scripture in Philippians from Paul, not that I have already arrived or am perfect, but I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. It's true in the realm of spirituality. It's true in the realm of commitment that God intends for every Christian, I believe, to enter a deeper commitment than he or she already has in the realm of service, to be a pioneer. Maybe we think we're doing all we can do. Somebody says, you know, I'm too busy, but then they find out, you know, I can find, I can find an hour a week to come and help out with feed my sheep. Or I can go uh, to NADA and help out with the kids there. We often think we're maxed out and we carve up our lives in the service we can render. But I think in Christ we are called to realize that we can still be pioneers, that we can still give more of ourselves to Christ. It's true in relationships as well. We all have a circle of friends, hopefully, and that circle is not usually real big and it's fine to meet together with old friends there's nothing better but it's also a good thing to meet some new people to make some new friends to form some new relationships go ye therefore to all nations jerusalem judea samaria the uttermost parts of the world those are people and there are people right here that we need to meet that we don't know how do we get outside of the familiar paths that we live in 
Sure, we can sit with the same people every Wednesday night and have dinner, and that's a good thing, but what about some new people coming to have dinner? And when they come, do we sit with them, new acquaintances, all a part of pioneer faith, you see, that, that ventures beyond the waters or the territory that we, and the circles that we already live in. What about Abraham's experience? He did so. He left all those familiar paths and went to new ones, and he just, everything just worked out great, didn't it? Everything was just a rose garden for him. No, it wasn't. In fact, this very passage says, even though he left home looking for a homeland, there's a real sense in which he never found it, in that he never found that city that was what does a tent dweller nomad want? He wants a house that has foundations, not just stakes and ropes. But this passage tells us that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob continued to live in those tents even though they were in the Holy Land. And they had battles to fight and challenges to meet, and they lost loved ones, and it didn't all just work out great. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign land, verse 9 says, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob and heirs of the same promise. Home is sort of an idea. I ask a friend here in Winchester, how long will I have to live here until I'm not an outsider and this is home? You know what he told me? He said, you won't live long enough. <laughs> well, this is all I got though. This is all I got. But in another sense, I long for a home that's homier than Winchester, don't you? Surely you do. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself into that heavenly mansion. And reminder that don't get too, don't feel too good much at home here. Even if you're born here and went to Clark County High School, this isn't home. This isn't home ultimately. Don't get too attached. Abraham never fully felt at home, never stopped living in tents. He lived there in the promised land as though he were in a foreign land, the text says. And furthermore, in verse 13, all these that they've named, this roll call of the faithful, quote, they all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And in that sense, Haran wasn't home and neither was Canaan in the long run because we're all exiles and strangers in the earth. Home is with God. Home is that celestial heavenly city of which the authors write in so many different ways, including the scriptures, the kingdom of God, the city of God, if you will. And isn't that the way of faith? This passage begins with the words that faith is what the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Though they didn't get there, Paul writes, though they didn't get there, they died in faith, having, not having received the promise, yet they saw it and grasped it from afar. Faith can somehow reach out there to what is hoped for and bring it home to now in one's heart. That's why Jesus said, yes, we're marching to Zion, we're marching toward that beautiful city of God, but in the kingdom of God, but in the real sense, the kingdom of God is where? He said, it's within you, didn't he? You gotta reach out by faith and bring it to now. While we wait, we experience the kingdom of God by faith. That's what a pioneer does. If I asked you to name the most noted American pioneer, what are some names that you will think of? Thank you. That's the first one you called out. We live near as one of his homes, don't we? Daniel Boone. Always moving. <laughs> and one of the most remarkable things about Daniel Boone was that when he turned 65 years old, he decided, I don't want to pay Kentucky taxes either. <laughs> 65 years old. And walked with his family, with his clan, to Defiance, Missouri, 400 miles, give or take, from here. I've been there. My son, Nathan, was married there at Defiance. And I went there for the wedding. 
I'd always heard he became a Missourian. A whole community there, a stone home that he built. For 20 more years, he was the village doctor and hunter. And rumor has it that he made it back to Kentucky a time or two, even in his 80s, and scholars are still trying to figure out whether that guy that some guy saw sitting at the Pioneer Trading Post was old Daniel or not. And he was buried there in defiance. Have you ever been to that grave? And his wife was buried there. And there's a copper bust of Daniel, and the nose is shiny as it can be. You know why? If you rub his nose, you, you get good, you make a wish or something. I don't remember the details, but there he sits. And there's a story there at the gift shop that when Kentucky came and said, we're going to take his body back to Frankfurt, that they gave him the wrong body on purpose. You know that story? And that Daniel is still, his remains are still at rest in Missouri, be that as it may. What a pioneer. And in many respects, you and I are here because of the Cumberland Gap Trail, the Wilderness Road that came up I-75 after it crossed there near, what, Corbin, Middlesburg, Middlesboro. And in a sense, Daniel never got there where he wanted to be. They say when he died, he still wanted to go west because the east kept catching up with him wherever he went. Well, that's Abraham in a real sense, and that's those of us who journey on in the community of faith. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. They tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smile drives their sorrows all away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again in that land of an unclouded day. They take some of the best hymns out of our hymnal, don't they, as they revise it. We journey. Even though we never get there in this world, but the journey's better than just standing still. Robert Louis Stevenson said to travel, hopefully, is even better than to arrive. My grandpa used to say anticipation is more fun than realization. And the world often thinks that pioneers are idiots because they do things like going somewhere and they don't know where they're going to go. They thought Copernicus and Galileo were heretics because they were pioneers of science. They laughed at Orbel and Wilbur Wright until one day that thing stayed in the air, a pretty good strip in North Carolina, even though they were Ohio boys. They scoffed at Martin Luther. They said Nelson Mandela was out of his head. Pioneers dream of what could be, what ought to be. They look for a better country, Paul says here. They dream of a better country. They're willing to travel and leave the familiar to get there, even if they die in faith not having received it. And what was the sum of it all? Abraham never made it. But Abraham made a start. And the people followed Abraham that believed that God had chosen them for something special. And they ultimately did build a city and a temple and laid sidewalks. And down those streets walked one day Jesus of Nazareth in part because of the start that Abraham made, even though he never made it himself. Walter Russell Bowie said, every living stone fashioned by faithful service is a part of the invisible city of that presence of God within which the walls, within the walls of which the spirits of unborn generations shall rally and take courage through the difficult days believe in that unseen city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. We celebrated some of them in 2009 who made it possible for us to be here at First Baptist Church in 1859. And we enjoy the fruits of their labors. And someday there will be others who follow us. And in the realms that we don't make it, maybe, they will. And that's a part of the journey. He went out not knowing where he was to go. I don't know what 2015 will bring. I have some thoughts of what I think it might bring and where I think I'll be. But I don't know. And you don't either. Let's make the trip anyway. What do you say? By faith. 
Shall we pray? Our Father, we believe that even though we don't know what holds the future, we know who holds the future. And that even though we don't know where we're going, we know who has called us to go. May we go faithfully and hopefully and joyfully by faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today, number 285. I know we sang it last week, but it's not in there by typo. I thought it was a good hymn for us to sing with this passage. May we stand together and sing. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Testing, testing. Pat Overby has attended our church in recent weeks, and she has moved to Winchester from Stanton, and she is a member of the uh, Stanton Baptist Church there, and she'd like to rededicate her life to Christ, she says, in coming this morning and join First Baptist Church uh, by letter from First Baptist Stanton. All in favor of receiving her as a full member, let it be known by saying, Welcome to First Baptist. And any opposed can say, boo. <laughs> and the motion carries. Good to have you, Pat. I think you'll find this to be a loving fellowship. And uh, you'll, you'll increase our strength as a church, and we'll find something for you to do. And we'll try not to bug you to death. Mary Columbia is not here this morning, but uh, she'll probably be calling you to do something in the near future. Good to be in God's house together. And those of us that are going to go to 
Powell County today to minister. We'll leave at 1.30 uh, from the parking lot. Maybe bow together for prayer, and I'd like to ask Judy Hicks if you would please to lead us in our benediction.